You're listening to Real Investor Radio with Craig Fuhr and Jack Bevere, where we cover advanced real estate investing topics to help you stay ahead of the curve in your real estate investing business. Hey, welcome everybody to Real Investor Radio. It is a new year, Jack. How are you? Doing great, man. Doing great. Good to see you. You as well, my friend. Uh, man, it's um, episode 29 here, and uh, we're starting off a new year, 2024. Got a lot to talk about. We have some great guests coming up over the next uh, few weeks and months that are already lined up in the can, ready to rock. Today, I'm excited to uh, have our guest. But uh, first, Jack, uh, how were your holidays? Uh, everything was good. We uh, Holidays were, were spent at home, hanging out with family, and then uh, got out of town, went down to St. Thomas for a week. And so I've been hanging out down here. I'm actually, that's where I'm at still right now, but you know, can't miss the podcast and was super excited to have our guest on today. So I uh, rigged up a little studio here in a bedroom and I'm ready to rock. Tell the truth, Jack, how much work versus how much uh, recreation are you getting in? Be honest, because I know no, you approved good. at least three loans yesterday. At least now, yeah, it's it's we have uh we have some good systems and set up uh set up so that I can uh just check in and do emails for an hour or so and I'm you know can keep the trains rolling so all's well all's well the, the most efficient man in the business, ladies and gentlemen, Jack Bevere. All right, so we have a great guest today, uh, absolutely the most timely guest you can have in January, uh, Mr. Doug Stein. Jack, I'll let you introduce him, and uh, I think we have a really great com and timely conversation around tax law, tax planning, uh, a lot of things to think about uh, this time of year for better real estate investors. And so uh, go take it away. Yes. Yeah, so uh, very excited to have Doug Stein here with us today. Doug is a tax attorney that I met back in 2016, I think. Um, we were uh, looking to do some tax planning and at the time wasn't thrilled, frankly, with the advice that we were getting from a more strategic point of view. And that's really, I think, something that a lot of real estate investors have that uh, issue with, particularly as they're growing, right? They've got their CPA that does their tax return. They do their tax return competently. They know what those files are and that's, that, that runs fine. But as you're growing and hopefully making more income, more taxable income, you want to make sure that you can avail yourself of whatever opportunities there are to be efficient about that. And um, so we kind of started that process in 2015. And I probably spent the whole year fumbling around getting lots of not so great advice from a, a number of different kinds of consultants and kind of in that journey of looking for uh you know looking for advice and looking for someone who i could really connect with on a strategic planning point of view uh i was able to fortunately cross paths with doug so doug is a tax attorney based out of uh based out of atlanta in georgia and um he when I met Doug, the com the nature of the conversation was materially different than I had experienced before. Mm. I had lots and lots of conversations with uh, tax guys, right, tax and, and and women who um, could tell me, you know, could could you know could tell me the code or could you know could explain to me what the the situations were, but it was, I'd have to bring an idea to them and they'd say, well, let me go research that and I'll let you know if we can do that. And then they'd come back and they'd be like, ah, yeah, that doesn't work. And here's mm. the bill. And, and so I was just fumbling in the dark because I don't know what I don't know, right? Like, you know, real estate, buying houses, fixing them up all day, but the codes, you know, I don't think it's, me it's meant, not even measured in pages. It's measured in inches or not feet. feet. And so, uh, you know, I just don't know what I don't know there. And so different kind of corporate structuring, ideas and um you know how we run operations uh and how that impacts how it you know the, the what we what we might be little tweaks that we can make from an operational point of view to take advantage of tax efficiency you know that was what i was really looking for and my in my conversations with doug i had the the nature of the conversation was different he was mm -hmm. a i i consider doug a um a business mind he talks about risk uh, you know, he doesn't say you can do this, or you can't do that. He talks about it on the spectrum of risk. Like here's the safe Harbor. Here's the gray area. Here's the case law, uh, that you definitely can't cross. And then that was a much more, uh, I think productive, uh, set of conversations because then I can make business decisions, right? Cause not, not tax law is not black and white. There's nothing about law, any, any, you know, any part of law that is black and white. 
Um, but talking about it on a risk spectrum, I felt I found to be much more productive. So mm. anyway, long winded introduction, but uh, been working with Doug now for, I guess, seven years plus, And um, he uh, joins us in our uh, Real Investor Roundtable Mastermind at, on at least an annual basis. And, you know, hope, you know, sometimes he makes it two or three times a year, which is great. It's always very productive. And uh, also consider him a friend at this point. We've worked together and done, done so much together. So really excited. To, to, Doug, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, I think we wanted to, given the timeliness in the year, talk about the changes between 22 and 23, as you know, our listeners are getting ready to talk to their tax folks, make sure that they're not tripping on themselves based off of the changes. It's there, there are some things that have changed between 22 and the 23 prep. Talk about some differences in operations from a tw on 24 forward that are different than 23. Um, I think we're going to cover a little bit about uh, just kind of like the state of the IRS right now. Um, and Definitely, and some new stuff that's just hit the street, and some new stuff that's in the pipe right now that we should all be aware of as it relates to tax. Doug, welcome to the show. And thank you for having me. I really appreciate it, guys. Jack, I think that's the nicest thing I've ever heard anybody ever say about me, ever. Like, ever. <laughs> Good uh, deal. Um, you know, so you've introduced me just fine. I don't think I need to add anything to that, but I. I would want to start today's conversation with uh, what I think is the latest and greatest stuff, which really has real implications for people. Uh, and my, my expectation is that most people fall flat over the course of the year or two. Um, and eventually, you know, enforcement will get picked up. And I'm talking specifically about the Corporate Transparency Act, the CTA. Uh, the CTA uh, is a new act. Actually, it's an old act. It was enacted back in 2017 as part of uh, funding the U.S. military. It really comes down to breaking down the transparency that currently exists within the U.S. entities. You, know, you form an LLC. Nobody knows who that LLC uh, is owned by. Often you have an LLC owned by an LLC, owned by another LLC, owned by a trust, and on and on and on. And on. Um, under the CTA, all of that goes away. So people who want to hide, you know, who quote unquote hide who the ownership is, that's more or less dead for all extents and purposes. Uh, the CTA now requires you to report who the beneficial owners are, and there's a whole long definition of that. So 20% or more equity, um, voting control effective or deemed to be ownership control through family members, uh, being a manager of an LLC, uh, and on and on and on. So all of that has to now be reported. And the new rule is anything formed from you know three days ago, four days ago, uh, beginning of the year, that has to be reported within 90 days. Originally, it was 30 days. That got extended to 60 days. And then that just got extended late last year to 90 days. So now you have 90 days to report. And if it's a pre-existing entity, you have until 2025 to report. But I'm not sure it's wise to wait until 2025 to do that. So let's, let's break that down just so everyone understands. So right now, like I can go on my you know, Department of Assessments and Taxation website for the state and look up to see who, you know, I can look up and I can generally see uh, the uh, either formation documents, articles of organization, um, mm -hmm. and, the, and, the, and the original operating agreement often. I can see who the resident agent is for, um, you know, for lawsuits, you know, serving lawsuits, for example. Right. But this is something, and that, so that, that information is already currently public. But as you mentioned, often when we'll go on there, we'll see a resident agent and it'll be an attorney or it'll be an attorney. And if you see the original operating agreement, by the way, you know, it's, it's originally set up by, by the attorney, right? So you don't get much, if any information about that. Maybe you do some skip tracing, you find out it's owned by another LLC and there's another attorney. So there, you know, it's, it's still, there, there's ways to obfuscate who the owners are under the current, under the current, um, I guess, rules under the current rules. Right. Now, this is going to change. You're going to have to actually now report. Now, how, how do, you're going to report who the beneficial owners are of any particular LLC and ride, and you're going to have to ride that up like the entire chain of LLCs, right? If you have an LLC that owns an L, you know, a trust that owns an LLC that owns an LLC, you're going to have to actually trace back the beneficial ownership up to, you know, whoever those humans are, right? Mm. And, that, and that's, that's right. a big change here. We're, we're going to get some transparency. Well, and let's draw the distinction here. The government's going to get some transparency with respect to that. Now, we're, so we, we're, we're going to be required to report those beneficial owners, but that, that doesn't mean that that information is going to be made public, right? Mm -hmm. 
So there's two different issues here. Uh, you are correct. It all gets reported with uh, FinCEN, uh, which is the U.S. government, who is then is sharing that information with the Internal Revenue, um, with DOJ, with the FBI, um, Department of Homeland Defense, uh, all those things. Right? All those entities are all getting shared that information. Technically, it's not out in the open public, so I, Doug Stein, don't have the right to file for a FOIA request and get that. Mm -hmm. The catch to FOIA it is Freedom of Information Act request. I'm sorry, Freedom of Information Act. Yes. Um, so that's not available. That was actually specifically in the Act that FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, is inapplicable to the CTA. But here's the catch: uh, someone sues you in the LLC. Um, you know, normal request for an attorney would be to request your filings and show me the filings you filed with the Secretary of State to show you've actually done the things you're supposed to do. Um, sometimes I'll ask for your tax return, but now I'll ask for your CTA filing. Really? Uh, and that's, oh, yeah. a, that's a, that's like a depositionable, you yep. know, a, a requestable, a, a document that can be requested and must be produced. It's a business record, right? Wow. So that's you know, really tax. Yeah. It's something people haven't thought about. Uh, historically, we say no one could get your tax returns, but in a deposition, if it's relevant to the case, I can get that information because it's a business filing that you filed. It's not privileged. There's an attorney client privilege, there's an accountant privilege. The CTA is no different. I can request it and I should get it. And if I don't get it, I can always, you know, hound the court and try to get the court order to get it. So it is correct in the sense that the general public doesn't have easy access to it. But if someone sues you, it's a different story. Really interesting, though, from in the, in the implications, you know, just kind of going up to 300,000 feet here, the implications with respect to if the government's got all of that information and with technology going the way that it is, they'll now like within within five maybe 10 years right like probably much less than that be able to based off of these filings produce a pretty succinct map right of like of of who owns what right like how did the, you know which which people traced all these different things now the public won't be able to do that because as you just mentioned they can't get access to it unless they've got a kind of a need to know based you know because right. of a lawsuit for you know as the classic example but the government won't have that doesn't have that doesn't have that um that bar right like they, they'll just have access to that information and the various government agencies will be will be able to use that as they please frankly right in, you know in the in under the auspices of whatever you know under their mandate right to to enforce the laws of the united states so it's it's a it's kind of a game change it's not a game changer with respect to like the average american can figure out who owns what but it is a game changer from the government's point of view right yeah, I'm expecting the IRS to come in now with audits. It'll take them a couple of years. Let's give them three, five years. Um, we'll already know all the ownership interests and who owns what. Uh, so that sometimes when they ask for questions, never really ask the questions, right? I mean, we go through a lot of audits. We deal with a lot of those things on behalf of our clients. The questions are historically not artful. They ask the wrong question or they ask the right question the wrong way. So I can comply just to the point of compliance, but not actually giving you what you want. Um, you know, now it's going to be different. They'll say, here's, you know, here's the CTA. It says you own all these assets. Give me all the information about all these assets. And that's, that's harder, you know, harder to avoid. They'll, yeah, mm -hmm. they'll know, this will help them ask the right questions um, in, a, in, the, in that context. So it's very interesting. So CTA was, uh, I guess, brought about under the guise of security and sort of transparency. Yes? Correct. Yeah. That's, uh, that's why they say it came about. It's not really true, but it's what they say. Wait, yeah. what's CTA stand for? Corporate Transparency Act. Corporate Transparency Act, got it. So the Corporate Transparency Act has been in the works for a long, long time. Uh, it actually goes back to when Europe changed, right? And they became part of the EU and they had their own Corporate Transparency Acts that existed because the concepts that we have in the US don't really apply in Europe. Um, European banks didn't want to lend to Americans because they couldn't figure out who owned what. Mm. And it's not that we don't trust your disclosures, but they don't trust your disclosures. <laughs> Um, so the U S was put in this really weird position where they couldn't do a lot of international business. And part of it was brought on by the U S you know, the whole, uh, U, um, UBS issue and all of the FATCA filings and all of those things were part of it. Um, the EU basically said, absent something like this, we can't, we can't open up our markets to you. So the U S had to do it. And the easiest way for them to get it through, through Congress was really through a funding mandate, which is the military who wants to vote against the military. So they went through the military, and lo and behold, here you are. We've got this. It's literally, literally part of a part of a procurement act for the military. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, 
get a lot of great stuff buried in those bills. I, I'm interested, uh, you know, Jack and Fred and, and the folks that uh, are members of um, the Real Investor Roundtable, I, I think are a sort of a, a step above in terms of um, operational um, abilities and, and sort of the size of their businesses. But for the average investor, uh, we're talking real estate investor here, um, who, you know, does multiple transactions a year, um, has been in business for, you know, several years. And, you know, they're not, they're not, they're not hobbyists. This is what they do for a living. Right. What is something like this going to do in, uh, due to that, that person in terms of cost, uh, in, in, uh, uh, you know, if they have to, uh, form a new LLC and what are the ramifications of not complying with this and reporting? And how do you how do you register? Yeah, I'm interested. That was my next question, but those those first two. Okay, um, so I think structures are going to start changing. I don't think anyone has a choice anymore. Mm. The, the classic structure was holding company LLC for every property, or maybe series of LLCs to hold properties in this area and that area, then underneath that a new LLC. Um, each one of those LLCs now needs to file. Each one of those entities needs to go through the whole process. Uh, it's a major undertaking going forward. I just did my CTA this morning for my law firm. It took me about five minutes. I got one entity, mm -hmm. right? Um, you add on, some of my clients have 100 entities, 150 entities, 200 entities. You're doing that same task over and over and over again. And then if someone dies during the year, which happens, now these, you need to file again for the estate. And then if the estate pays out, you have to file again. So every single time there's a change, you've got to go yeah. through this process. Um, if you bring in new investors, you know, then every time a new investor comes in that meets the criteria, you have to do it again. It's a that 20 burden. threshold. Yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah. And the, yeah, the criteria in case uh, the, the folks didn't hear Jack is um, it's anyone with more than a 20% ownership in the LLC or, or company, correct? Or control correct. or, or, or control. who has control. Yeah. Uh, Effective understood. or actual. Which is a bar that, that that's a TBD bar, right? Like. Right. That's yeah. right. So let's say you've got six owners. So nobody actually has 20%. They're all equal owners. Yeah. Right? Then, then who files? And the answer is, who's got effective control? Do you have a consortium of three people that have effective control? Mm -hmm. um, you, know, you can get into a lot of these questions. The manager is always going to file. Right? They're, they have no incentive not to file. Um, our position is if we've got a situation, let's say we have six owners, nobody's got more power than the other. We're going to report them all. Right? My risk is either a penalty or criminal prosecution. Uh, let's take the criminal prosecution off the table for a second, because hopefully we don't meet that. I'm not paying the penalty. I mean, it's, these aren't cheap penalties. Mm -hmm. I'm so curious. Do do just, just curious. What is the penalty? I think the, ten, the penalty is um, up to $10,000 per year per report that was due. Interesting. Gotcha. And then uh, we were speaking uh, right before we pressed the record button about um, there is something that actually went into place today, I think you said, um, or that, yeah. that, yeah. And so uh, if you're, if you're going to try to do it today, we'll hope that the IRS servers or whatever servers are handling this are robust because right. it appears there may be a rush of folks uh, getting ready to file. So talk about that. Yeah. So historically, I shouldn't say historically, if you go back to, um, to ACA, right? The, the Health Care Act that came about and everyone had to go, on, go online and try to sign up for yes. health insurance. Right. That, was, um, that was a failure, right? I mean, the systems kept crashing. Nothing really worked. It lost your data. It didn't do all the things it was supposed to do. It was just bad. Uh, the hope is that FinCEN's got their stuff together a little bit better than that, and it won't crash. I, I personally lack that confidence. It is the government. You know, they have a tendency to do all sorts of things, and they may not have enough bandwidth to make it all happen. But it is open today. It was working this morning. So I was very excited about that. Uh, and we're, you know, I, my bet is people who, so only entities that are formed this year forward have to report within the next 90 days. Right. The rest Anybody of us have until the end of the year. Have until the end of the year. Have until January 1st of next year to do it. Um, you know, why wait? Because, you know, if you're like me, you get to December, you forget you did everything, you have to figure it all out. Uh, we've already started scrubbing our clients to know who's got LLCs. We're going to have to do that. And it gets even worse. You have a trustee because you may have a corporate trustee, right? And we, didn't, we ignore the corporate trustees. You have to go to the individuals who own it. And that's also very unclear in who actually gets reported. 
Is it the grantor, the person who created the trust? Is it the beneficiaries? Is it some beneficiaries, not other beneficiaries? There's a lot of um, a lot of things we don't know about it. When I so do I have to do a filing for every operating entity or every entity, right? Like if I've got a non-operating entity that doesn't have employees, doesn't have any, it doesn't even have an EIN, doesn't have, uh, you know, uh, doesn't file a tax return. It's owned by another LLC. Do mm -hmm. I have to file for that child LLC and disclose the parent the whole way up to the humans? Or do I just, or can I just start at the operating entity level and disclose the humans above that? At this point, it's every single entity, even if it has been liquidated. Even if it has been liquidated during that yeah. year? Yes. So it's, okay. it's a weird rule. If I form an entity, let's say this year, and it terminates, or I formed an entity last year, and I liquidated this year, technically, I'm, as it's currently written, we're supposed to file for that. So even dead entities. So a lot of folks who are really concerned about this idea, right? Like they're seeking, you know, they're looking for anonymity. They don't want, you know, they don't want to, you know, they don't want their business to be put out in the public sphere. A lot of them have gone a step beyond just LLCs and involve trusts, right? Because you can right. then have a trustee who's in Nevada and, you know, there's no connect, you know, there's no obvious connection to the people who are the beneficiaries and absent a court order, no yeah. obligation to disclose the trust documents and the rules behind that trust and who the beneficiaries are. So that's become a very popular structure for, uh, for asset protection and anonymity for mm -hmm. a lot of folks. How does this new law impact those trusts? So as it pertains to the government, the trusts are ignored and we're going to the human beings. So those, uh, those trusts are going to have, th that'll be part of the disclosure. You're going to have to disclose the, like if, if, if someone's a beneficiary of a trust, that beneficial own, uh, that, that beneficial interest is going to be part of, um, is, is going to be part of this filing requirement. Correct. That's super That's interesting. Right. Yeah. And so it's, what, what, if you, what if you got a, uh, what if you got a, uh, yeah, I, I, and I'm not, you know, I know there's no case law or anything on this, right? Like none of, nothing's been tested yet, but say you got a trust for your kids and you got four kids or I mean, you got uh, six kids. So no one's above, no one's nest definitely above that 20% threshold. Are we disclosing that? Is the trust, you know, is the, is the trustee disclosing that because they're the one in control and they're also disclosing that there are, these kids who may receive a benefit from this trust? How does that, how so, does that work? So that's about as clear as mud right now. The regs okay. don't really deal with that in a meaningful way. Um, in fact, the regs don't even seem to require the trustee to tell me who the beneficiaries are. Hmm. They have someone who has the power to change the beneficiaries. I don't think it makes it any better. I think it makes it worse because I've got a report. So if I don't know who it is, I'm going to throw everybody down that I could possibly think would be in that mix. Yeah. And if like, and there, is there any guidance on, you know, d d because someone like, do, am I the beneficiary because I received a benefit and the, and, you know, and there was a hundred grand dis you know, dispersed to beneficiaries and 50 of that went to, went to Joey is Joey now hit that threshold because he's above 20% or, and the other ones aren't because they didn't receive a benefit in that year. Or is it, or is the, the, the disclosure requirement based off of the potential to be, a, to receive a benefit? You know, is it, an actual, this, is it yeah. an actual benefit or potential benefit? Yeah, at this point, it's just the potential for benefit. Mm. And the question becomes, how far do I have to go? Almost every trust says, if everyone dies, who takes? Right? So do I now need to report all those takers Downstream, of last resort? Right. right. Or even upstream. It could be your parents. Right? It really depends on, mm -hmm. on, um, on the structure. It, it is not clear. They did not do a good job on explaining what happens with trusts. Shocker. So, yeah. Can we yeah. Can we talk about uh, quickly, like the mechanism for reporting? It looks like this is a uh, FinCEN is a part of the treasury. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm a guy, I've, I've got an LLC or three, got a bunch of houses thinking about right. buying some more. I don't, I don't want to go hire an attorney or, or, or an accountant to do all this for me. I think I can do it myself. Should I do that, Doug? And, and, and how would I, how, what is the mechanism for doing that? That's a harder question to answer. Um, I think if it's one entity or two entities, the typical person can do it. They're going to have to go into the system. They'll have to register with the system. They'll have to get the EIN numbers. They'll have to upload their passport or their driver's license. And they'll have to report the one or two entities that they own. I think I have to do it. You, you can't do just one entity at a time. I'm sorry, you can't do two entities or four entities. It's one entity at a time. Um, 
we got a number from FinCEN, so we can file as many as we want using the same number, but we have to report all the relevant data. I think once you get beyond, let's say five, um, you're talking real time, and you're talking you know, real risk, it's probably better to hire people. I have no doubt that someone's gonna create something out there to make it easier. Consultancy, yeah. Yeah, yeah consultancy, an app or something that someone's gonna create. Mm. But until then, um, this is gonna be ugly. And if you yeah. read, I mean, reading the comments are fascinating to me because we read through the comments as they were coming through and people were saying, well, it's about time we know who owns the real estate. I mean, literally, they would say uh, in, in, of, um, in New York, you know, the Chinese are buying up the real estate in New York. We need to know who owns it, mm. right? Which is just, first of all, why you'd ever put this stuff in writing is shocking to me. Um, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's clear that people want to know who owns stuff, right? It's mm -hmm. just a different form of voyeurism. Um, and that's where it's going to head. You know, I could see, I could see both sides of that coin. Uh, even though I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a much more uh, on the side of privacy, but um, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm just concerned for the average guy who is trying to traverse all of this while still maintaining a business and trying to grow it. Um, how, how tough this is going to be um, to sort of get through. So I've always believed if, the, um, if your structure is based upon anonymity, you will fail. Right? I always assume in the end, everything's going to be known. Any decent attorney will get that information anyway. Um, I, I'm always worried about the unanticipated consequences. Right? Every law has got these, it has a consequence and no one anticipated. Uh, and they just, they bite people. Like that's why they're there. They're made specifically to bite you. Um, this one's got me concerned. It has me concerned just because I think the typical person doesn't know their obligation. Right. Uh, the typical, I was talking to an attorney last week. He said, well, it doesn't apply to LLCs. And I said, well, show me that. I mean, that, that'd be awesome, man. Um, they went back and they said, well, okay, we're wrong. It applies to all LLCs. I'm like, okay. How about LPs, limited partnerships? It applies to limited partnerships. Um, basically, anything you form is now subject to it. Even a general partnership technically is subject to these rules. And from a tax perspective, you know, GP could be as simple as we've just both agree we're going to share in the lottery ticket. Now I've got a general partnership. And do I have to mm -hmm. report that? So I, I think I'm hopeful that the government's going to be reasonable. We all know how likely that is to be the case. Um, I, I think from the typical person, you know, the government probably isn't going to pursue them historically. They like to go after bigger cases and make a bigger splash that make people look bad. Um, but give them time. You know, I'm confident it's just to be another thing they'll throw onto the list. All right, folks. Well, uh, we have Doug Stein coming back for one more episode. I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, this is Craig Fuhr and Jack Bevere with attorney Doug Stein. We'll come back for the next episode. Tune in.